I'm Rebecca Blank, Chancellor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this year's virtual Go Big Read event, featuring author and journalist David Cullen and student activist Jacqueline Corin, discussing the New York Times best-selling book, Parkland, Birth of a Movement. Organizing our university-wide book club is always a big job, and this year was a particular challenge. I wanna thank two people who worked hard to ensure that all Badgers and members of the community beyond campus as well could take part no matter where they were. Lisa Carter, Vice Provost for University Libraries, and Sheila Steckel, who coordinates Go Big Read and directs our library teaching and learning program. This past summer, following the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis, we saw millions of people embrace a call to action in cities across the United States. Parkland explores a similar effort, what the Washington Post called a carefully led rebellion by young people in response to gun violence. Parkland follows teenage activists who survived the 2018 school shooting in Parkland, Florida and transformed their anger into action. They sparked a bipartisan movement that continues to influence the national conversation about gun violence and gun policy. Parkland is our 12th Go Big Read book. And this year, the logistics are a bit different. Students who are off campus received eBooks instead of print copies. Many discussions about the book are taking place online rather than in person. And this year's keynote presentation by David Cullen and Jacqueline Corin was recorded ahead of time. But as in past years, we're united by sh the shared reading experience. I know that this compelling story about responding to tragedy with a sense of purpose has already sparked many interesting conversations, certainly on campus, and I suspect off campus as well. Here at UW, Professor Kathleen Bartson Culver is leading a seminar called Purposeful Action, Parkland Protest and You. Her students are using the book to explore the dynamics of social and political movements. Faculty teaching nearly 100 other course sections in academic areas as wide ranging as dance, chemistry, public health and business are incorporating Parkland into their teaching. Outside the classroom, in the spirit of generating vigorous, vigorous discussion, the students involved in our Forensics Club, Wisconsin Speech and Debate, are soliciting speeches on topics related to Parkland. The Chazen Museum of Art has created a special curriculum on the role of art in activism and in helping people survive tragedy. And community residents are taking part in virtual conversations hosted by public libraries in Madison and surrounding towns. At the end of October, University Housing will host a live virtual event featuring young activists, including former and current UW-Madison students, sharing their personal jury journeys into social advocacy. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about our two keynote speakers. Dave Cullen is a print and television journalist who's covered mass murders in this country for two decades. He was one of the first reporters on the scene after the Columbine High School massacre in 1999. In Parkland, he chronicles the resilience and tenacity of the survivors rather than the shooting itself. Jacqueline Corin was a student at Parkland. Shortly after 17 students and faculty at her school were murdered, she mobilized 100 classmates on a lobbying trip to the Florida State Capitol. She also helped plan the March for Our Lives in Washington and helped to unite more than 2 million people in 900 events around the world. As a student at Harvard University, Jacqueline is continuing her advocacy work by organizing Get Out the Vote events. To David Cullen and to Jackie Corin, we're honored to have you with us and thank you for being here. And to all of you participating in Go Big Read here at UW, around Madison and across the country, I hope you'll find this conversation fascinating and inspiring. Thank you all. Hi there students, uh, I'm Dave Cullen and uh, I'm really kind of bummed not to be there with you uh, because it's one of the great joys of my life to connect with students at high schools and colleges and, and talk and see what you're all about. Uh, but uh, we'll do some of that uh, virtually. And the upside is uh, we're doing this from my apartment in Brooklyn and specifically right inside my writer's studio. I have a two bedroom apartment, so I like right, right inside my apartment and here's where I do it. Um, and back there, is actually the storyboard for this particular book, which we'll look at a little later. Because uh, so I continue inside uh, my process and how I actually get, uh, go about creating a book like this. So I said I would never go back, 
right into the scene of a crime of something like this. Which, by the way, my editor uh, said should be the first line of the book. And that was one of the few big disagreements we had. Uh, we'll talk about why, but um, if you've read, even <laughs> if you've done your reading, if you've done, yeah, even read the, the first part of the book, um, you'll see that I had two bouts of secondary PTSD uh, in my 10 years on Columbine. It really, it really messed me up. And my shrink said, basically, if you go back to like directly into the scene of a crime is like, uh, uh, well, I don't even want to say it, it could, be, could be bleak for me. And, um, and I had very strict rules of what not to do. Um, but then the morning after um, Parkland, what was happening was already so amazing. Um, and uh, I was already, but the morning after, I was already writing a piece for Politico titled something like, uh, will this time really be different? Will the Parkland kids make this different? Um, because it, it was happening that fast. And uh, Anderson Cooper's uh, producer called me, and I'd already done his show the first night and was booked to do it again. And she called and said, hey, uh, if I put you on a plane, would you do the show with him down there tonight? Um, and and she sort of like knows about my history. And I was like, God, I'm, you know, I'm not really allowed to do that. Um, but I was really kind of drawn because I thought, uh, and I'm thinking like, well, maybe just for a couple hours. And I'll just talk to the students about doing something different this time. And I won't go there to cover it all, much less to cover like the grief and what the horror of what it's like to go, or especially the, the murderer. Like I, I'm done with them. I, I didn't care about that guy, like F him. Um, so, um, I thought about it, I thought like, well, maybe I'll do it. But then we, essentially we couldn't work the logistics out because I'd already agreed to do several shows on another network in the afternoon when I would have to be flying there. Um, but I would already in my head kind of made the decision of like maybe break the rules. Um, so I'd taken that step. So when my editor from Vanity Fair called me on Saturday after we'd all seen Emma Gonzalez and he said like, have you seen this? I'm like, it's amazing. I'm blown away. It's just like, this whole thing is just, this is really different. Um, and he said, he's a friend of mine, so he said, I know you're not allowed to go, uh, but would you consider going? Um, and I was like, God, um, I, you know, I, I can't, that, you know. Uh, I mean, basically my shrink had said, you, you, you know, you could be in a mental hospital or much worse um, if you do this again. Um, but so I thought about it and I said, like I had a couple of ground rules. Number one is, um, you know, no writing about the grief for what that's like and no writing about the murderer. I'm just there to cover the uprising, which is great, it's inspiring. So that's hopefully safe for me. And number two, I was literally two years late already on my uh, Gay Soldiers book um, and didn't want, and I was making good progress and didn't want to interrupt. So I said like five weeks max, that was our, our understanding. I'm not a day more because the uh, they, they announced the, the march on Washington while we were talking about it Sunday morning and I said, okay, that's a great stopping point, five weeks. I'll cover it for you through that, and then I'm done, and I'll go back to my book. Um, so we have that firm agreement. You know, uh, I make these things uh, all the time, and I mean them when I make them. But so, uh, so then the first thing was like the first hurdle, and that's one of the things I want to talk about today is some of the hurdles in journalism and some of the key decision points um, that somebody in my position goes through to create something like this. So the first hurdle was kind of always the first leg, how do I start? Like, how do I find these kids? Like, and I already felt like I was late because it was Sunday. So we're like four days into this and like all these other journalists who are down there have a huge head start and have already gotten to know these uh, kids well before the swarms of us have come. Um, and in Columbine, I get asked all the time why I started this to begin with and how I chose it. You know, I, I didn't choose it. I lived in Denver and the day it happened, um, as I, I had the TV on for local news over lunch, and I saw the first reports of just in, a no re, of shots fired at this high school I'd never heard of called Columbine. Uh, no reports of injuries, but just in case it turned into something, I got in my car and I drove out there. And I didn't know where there was. Uh, I knew it was in the western suburbs toward the mountains, and friends who'd grown up there gave me a couple of different exits. So, you know, I do what journalists do. You sort of drive toward like the fire or the sound of gunfire or whatever it is, and you sort of like, figure it out. And um, so I drove out in that direction. And in that case, out my driver's side uh, window, as I was driving there, I saw up in the sky a circle of about eight uh, helicopters circling. And that's when my stomach clenched. I was like, oh my God, something horrible 
is happening there. This is way worse than I thought. Um, but, you know, as a journalist, also you just engage, like you're working now, I can't deal with the emotional part. Um, so I literally try to line my car up with the helicopters at that exit, and I literally, literally drove toward the helicopters in the sky until I hit a police barricade. Um, and you go close to my foot, and I said, which way is Columbine High? He said, that way, and I ran that way. And so that's how that started. So this time, um, I wasn't sure how to get going. Um, but what I didn't realize, too, is like by covering this larger picture for 20 years, you're taking more and more steps towards something, steps I had no idea. And um, sadly, I'm kind of like the, the mass murder guy. So people call me all the time uh, to comment on these after, including journalists. So for those few days since Parkland, I'd been helping many journalists on the phone, including a guy from the Times of London. Um, and as I was trying to figure out how to like find and search for you know different leads I had of finding these kids, um, a Google alert on myself saved me. I got a Google alert that I was quoted in the Times of London uh, in the Sunday paper um, because he had quoted me talking about this and also said in the piece that he'd been down there with these kids with David Hogg and uh, uh, Emma Gonzalez. So I was like, wow. So um, I texted him back and five minutes later I had David Hogg's uh, cell phone number. Um, so I called David up because the guy said, you know, David's happy to talk to reporters. So I called him and he put me on the speakerphone, turned out to be Cameron Kasky's living room with all of the March for Our Lives kids, which I didn't really realize till later. And I'm talking to them and, um, you know, it's so the first hurdle solved and the first really weird thing came up. Um, it was several things. First of all, uh, David Hogg was the most sort of kind of silly, happy-go-lucky guy, you know, joke every other line, just full of just joy and and giddy and, you know, kind of silly guy, really intelligent, but, you know, silly too. Um, which later I was to realize, hmm, that David that I met over the phone the first day was so the opposite of the David I'd been seeing on TV. So like, how do I reconcile those two Davids? Um, but that was for later. Um, at the time, he said something really strange, which was, um, he said something like, um, you know, it's too late to get a seat on the bus. Uh, the bus is to Tallahassee because we've, we've got so many journalists already, but you can follow us along with us. And I was like, Tallahassee? I, I thought you were going to DC. Um, and he was like, oh yeah, 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 but we're doing this thing uh, two days from now. We're going to, down to Tallahassee. And I was like, oh God. Uh, because actually, I, my first reaction when I heard about the March for Our Lives was sort of two competing thoughts. One of them was, which is like, wow, that's amazing. That's kind of audacious. And number two is like, oh, my God, can they really pull something like this off in five weeks? I mean, anybody, like those high school kids, um, is this really going to be kind of a shit show? Or is this, you know, or, you know, half-baked? Um, it just didn't seem enough time to be pulled off. And then so when I'm talking to David and like, you're doing another thing? It's like, oh my God. Like you guys, you're putting more on your plate. Like, okay, um, you know, not my decision, but just thinking like, okay, um, this will be interesting. And then um, a young woman uh, with a sort of a light voice uh, said something about like, hi, I'm Jackie and like, I'm taking the lead on that and introduced herself. And I'm thinking like, okay, this is somebody I hadn't heard of more. Uh, there are more people doing this. Um, and, a key thing happened in that conversation too, because I knew immediately like, like, okay, if you're going to Tallahassee, I'm coming there immediately. I'm going with you to Tallahassee. I'm gonna follow the buses along. Um, but number two, and maybe more important is, um, I am not starting with the trip to Tallahassee. I need to start it the day before or whatever planning meetings. Like, I'm sure you're still figuring this out, right? And I asked them, are you having any like meetings working this out? And Jackie said, oh, yeah, yeah, kind of, but you don't want to come to that. It's just an organizational meeting. And I was like, no, I do. And she said, no, seriously, it's going to be like permission slips and like, you know, telling kids what to wear and like what to bring and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yes, that is exactly what I want to, um, uh, to go to. Because the last thing, the kind of journalism that I hate, and I don't know about you guys, but like reading is like, you know, or on TV, like, I don't want to, like, watch the stuff of, like, oh, you're here on the bus, and, like, how does it feel, or, you know, what are you planning to do? And it's all the same kind of rehearsed lines, because they have talked to literally, like, like two or three or four hundred journalists and said the same things over and over, and it just becomes a spiel, they become practiced, and, and it's about an inch deep, and, like, 
like, okay, I'm sure you're excited, which is just fine, but it's not that interesting. It's not below the surface. What I want to do is sort of like talk to kids behind the scenes and when they're not sort of in the throes of it, when, when they're still figuring it out and see like, what's that like? And permission slips, like immediately, like maybe that sounds boring, but to me what it says is like, like moms and dads, especially moms who might be worried about this and who like might not want to sign that permission slip and might be thinking like, what the hell am I sending my kid to who's still like probably like, you know, shell shocked and dealing with PTSD issues. Um, so those are the kinds of human stories where something interesting might be happening. Um, not the kind of scripted stuff that's going to be on CNN and everybody's going to see live. Um, so I said, yeah, I definitely want to do that. So, um, so uh, we agreed that, you know, she's like, sure. Um, that was definitely the best thing ever I did. Um, partly because then I was there for that meeting outside with like all hundred kids had to come and, and a lot of their parents. And I think I was the only journalist. Um, and um, so I was able to talk to kids sort of when they weren't, you know, on their guard. And, you know, I was a print guy too. So like uh, nobody's pointing a camera at them. They kind of weren't in that press mode. So I was able to just talk to them. Um, and some wanted to talk, some didn't, but I could start to get a feel for people behind the scenes and to meet Jackie before the throes of it all. Um, and start to, yeah, sort of like get uh, also sort of like a before picture before the intensity. Because the next day, when the buses were there, and there were, God, there must have been like 200 press people in that parking lot. It was, it was craziness, and that was interesting too. But like, I already knew what that scene was going to be like. I almost didn't need to be there as much as the day before. Um, but so then on the trip to Tallahassee, so I followed them, like drove, I rented a car and drove the the nine hours up to to, to Tallahassee, and then like did the whole spiel with them. And while we were doing it, I, I was just kept thinking like, ugh. I hate pack journalism. And I don't know if you're familiar with the term, um, but uh, you should be if you study anything like this. You know, journalists go in a pack, especially on campaign trails or like the White House correspondents. Think of that as the same group of people that ask the same freaking questions every day, get the same bullshit answers. And like, that's a job I would never want to have. Like, who freaking cares? I, I don't know what they're they're doing or what their purpose is. Um, but any kind of time is like a pack. And it's like we, we travel like a pack of wolves. We all do the same thing. We mimic each other's behavior. We add, end up asking the same kinds of questions. There's a definite sort of group think that uh, develops. And um, it's I find it very unhealthy and very unuseful and like not productive. And I never want to be a part of that. Um, I've always steered clear of that in my career for the most part. Um, so the whole time I'm covering these kids in Tallahassee, I keep thinking like, what am I doing here? And, um, and literally, how am I even gonna get access? There's probably like a thousand, you know, reporters on that trip, um, you know, maybe 300 different groups. And so like every Emma Gonzalez or, you know, uh, Cameron Kasky or David Hogg is outnumbered about a thousand to one. Like, so how am I going to get any meaningful time with them? Um, and what, why am I even necessary? Uh, you know, if there's like 300 stories, like, do we need the 301st? What am I adding? Um, but luckily I was having all those doubts and angst and, um, you know, arguments with myself the whole time as I was like doing this, um, because I, I knew the answer to them. Instinctively, I, the answer was coming me to, to me too, is uh, all those questions had pretty much the same answer, which is, I'm gonna stay. Um, meaning I'm gonna come back and stay on the story for, well, in that case, five weeks uh, for a while. And I know like most of these parachute journalists are gonna be here for one or two or three days. A small number will stay for a week and that's about it. And there might be like a couple, and then people come back for like the major events every now and then they'll like, we'll come back for graduation and blah, blah, blah here and there. But for the most part, um, they're not gonna stick with the story. And that's how I got my story on Columbine is the, 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 the people there know, they know, they notice very quickly uh, how invested you are and, and what your time horizon is and that you're not just looking for like, you know, the great quote for this piece or, you know, whatever quickie thing you wanna really understand. And a lot of your conversations are conversations to get to understand them, not just looking for the, you know, listening for like the one sentence you're going to use to put in the story, like you don't really care about that. Um, that I'm going to care and I'm going to find out. I'm going to understand what it's like uh, for them. And, um, and they're going to open up to me because they respect that and they like that because people always do. And, um, and it'll happen. 
And also because I'm gonna tell a different kind of story than people just telling in the moment story, which I also respect too, that's very important. It's just not me, uh, it's not just not my job. So um, some of the things, you know, really, I'm gonna spend a lot of the speech on the Tallahassee thing because so much was set in motion uh, those first couple of days. Um, one of the other things that happened is um, they gave, uh, uh, several of them gave speeches in the rotunda and I'm gonna read you just like a few lines from Alfonso's speech was what was incredibly moving to me. Uh, he's also like one of the great characters in my book because he's just uh, so funny and so much fun. Um, but he got was really angry. Um, and part of his speech, he said, uh, what we need is action. We are old enough to understand why someone might want to discredit us for their political purposes. Trust me, I understand. I was in a closet locked for four hours with people I would consider almost family, crying and weeping on me, begging for their lives. I understand what it's like to text your parents, goodbye, I might never ever get to see you again. I love you, I understand. So, um, and Alfonso was like crying when he uh, said all this, and uh, this is like really raw, this is I think six days after, and, um, but that was the moment that uh, I just couldn't handle it. And um, I mean, I just started bawling my eyes out and kind of like uh, scrammed to the, the back of this giant rotunda at the state capitol uh, to just get out of like, away from like the banks of TV cameras and the, the glare of all the lights and just like take a moment. And I just kept listening, but like uh, had to sort of recover myself. And um, I didn't, uh, I didn't know how it would affect me reading it. It's been a while since, uh, but it just sort of takes me back to that moment. And, and I think, but anyway, so what I was thinking though, as I was doing that is, uh, how come I'm the only one crying? Like, excuse me, but I, I mean, like, what is wrong with the other reporters that you're not reacting? Like, and he wasn't the only one, but like this kid is telling you what it's like to like think he's gonna die and to say goodbye to his parents by text. Like holy shit! I've never, uh, I've never heard that before. And uh, why are you people just standing here, like taking your notes or whatever? Like that's a normal thing. Um, and that thought has haunted me for a long time. And uh, not that everybody should cry. Like we all cry at different things. It's like, but uh, but no one was. Two hundred people or something of my profession. And not one of the other people were, was crying. Um, and I don't think I saw anybody cry the entire time covering it. I'm trying to think now, um, like in the whole year I spent with them. Um, and my take on that, I mean, this is my personal opinion, is like uh, they overlearned something important in journalism school, which is the concept of uh, objectivity which is one of the first things they teach you. I learned it in high school journalism, working for my uh, high school newspaper. You have to be objective. That's sort of like rule number one they teach you about journalism. And like most rules in life, uh, it's true. There's a lot of truth, this is very important, but you have to decide in your profession how, what your set of rules are and how much that rule should govern you. And, um, I think it over governs too many people because sort of like the flip side of objectivity, I don't want to say the opposite, but the flip side is subjectivity, which I find more important and more revealing and getting close to your subjects. Objectivity is all about this distance and like staying separated, not getting emotionally involved so you can sort of like not just tell their version of it and like, you know, not just tell it from their point of view. And that definitely has its place if you're covering a trial, obviously, and there's like, you know, Prosecution and the defense, and you have to treat them equally with, if you're covering politics and there's two people running against, of course, you know, be fair in lots of situations. But um, when you're doing this types of stories that I like doing, you're telling human stories about like what it's like to go, like, like there isn't, you know, Jackie Corn is a survivor, like there's no other side of that. Um, and the killer isn't the other side. It's like the other side, like what, like what she's doing. I want to understand it. And I want to bring to you, the reader, what it's like to be Jackie. Um, not just how she feels about, um, you know, going through um, a shooting, but what it's like to be creating a movement. And that was what I was there to cover. So like, what's that like to her? I want to like shrink that distance, not 
you know, make sure I'm like boxed off from her. Like I want to get inside her head and what it's like for her. Um, so that's kind of the core of what I do. And I actually want to widen out slightly um, to, um, to your calling. And, and I, one of the bigger things that I want to like one, the only bigger thing that I want to talk about, uh, you know, beyond the book and the subject of this book is for all of you, how you, your take on your profession and whether you're going to be, you know, nurse, elementary ed, electrical engineering, whatever it is, you also have to make decisions during your life of what kind of electrical engineer you're going to be. And I don't even know like different types of that, but, um, but how are you going to approach it? And for me, um, I feel like I heard my name called out like a couple different times in my life. That's really how I think of it because it was really sort of like my, my calling. Um, and the first time that I failed at it, that I didn't hear, um, was in second grade when I was seven years old at Queen of the Rosary High School um, outside Chicago at Elk Grove Village. And Sister Mary wrote one of the early days of the year um, across the blackboard, which is like the length of the room practically, and these huge block letters, V-O-C, vocation, a word that I had not yet encountered in my seven years on this planet. And I was like, vocation. Um, and she says, you know, it was like, uh, some of you are going to hear the call. And she was talking about to the priesthood or the sisterhood to the uh, um, to to be a nun, because um, that was still a big thing uh, when you were like a good little Catholic boy. And I had actually like already had decided I was going to be a priest or like you know maybe the pope or something. Um, and I'm actually not kidding. Um, but I was sort of staggered, like the calling. And the more she talked about it, I was like, and of course I had my hand up and was asking her, like, you have to be called. Like, what do you mean? Because I was really getting nervous sitting in my seat thinking like, like, I didn't know this was like invite only. Like, I seriously, like, I not exactly those words, obviously, but like, I was gonna be a wise ass about it. But I was like terrified that like, I thought I could just be a priest. I didn't know, like, I had to get some calling in. And then I was like, all these questions are basically like, like, is it literal? Do you like really hear something? And she was getting annoyed with me and thinking I was just like heckling me. Like, I was just really trying to find out. I was like, well, what is this gonna mean? And for the next main several years, I had this, you know, like, well, I guess, like, I never heard, like, no one ever spoken to me. Because she came, was pretty, making it up pretty much like you do literally hear something or like some people do. So I kept wondering, like, I'm going to hear something I never did. And then oddly, when I was a freshman in high in college in Urbana, Illinois, at U of I, as we called it, just a little bit south of you all, um, I heard it. It was participant observer. And I was in cultural anthropology class and I heard this term for the first time. And I heard those words and thought, oh, that's that's who I am. That's what I already kind of do in the world. Without no, like that's a thing, that's a profession. Um, and it was a type of anth cultural anthropology where you actually like immerse yourself in the group uh, to understand them by doing it, actually being part of it. So you really come to understand. Um, and that's a whole type of cultural anthropology. And from that moment, I knew that I'd been doing versions of that in my life. And I wanted to do some version of that for my life. And I didn't become a cultural anthropologist, but in grad school, I did study it quite a bit. But what I realized by then, because I, I didn't realize, figure out the writing thing to my 30s, and I went back to grad school in my 30s. And, uh, was that that's the type of uh, journalist I wanted to be. More of a, I wanted to be a writer, really kind of an anthropological writer. Uh, and so probably not participating, but if participant observers over here and objective journalists was here, I want to be much closer to here, like maybe about here, like not participating, but as close as that as I could get. And not at all like this objective distance thing. Um, and that's what I already figured out. It's like, I wanted to get close to people and inside their heads and tell what it was like. And somebody else could do the objective stuff, but I want to do the subjective stuff. And, um, you know, over decades, I've sort of figured this out more and more. Um, but by knowing what kind of my nature was, the other time I heard it, even what I liked even better is like Laurie Anderson, who's a performance artist and recording singer. She eventually married Lou Reed. Um, check her out if you haven't amazing and she does these spoken word things too uh, in addition to she's got an amazing voice um but she has this one where she's saying um you know 
what I really am is a spy. And she's talking about being a cultural spy and spying on people in, she talks about in airports, listening in like to salesmen, like, uh, but like that's her job. And then bringing that back through her art. And I was like, that's what I do. I kind of like spy on different forms of, you know, of the world and then like bring it back to the wider, then my job is sort of like cultural translator to bring it to you what that is. So, you know, that that's also what I do. Um, so, what I guess is like, uh, I, you know, I don't know. That is my type of quote journalism, but especially writing. And that's why I write these kinds of books and, you know, I hope it's useful to you, but, um, a lot of people who do great work as daily journalism, but it's a different kind of thing. And I very slowly figured out that's the kind that I want to do. Um, so several other things happened on that trip. Um, is I realized uh, the other kind of big thing was that character selection. Um, and then it was just for Vanity Fair for some magazine stories. I was going to write several pieces for them. Um, and... Uh, I already knew before I got there that obviously like David and Emma and Cameron would be probably characters relevant in this piece. As soon as I started to uh, get to know Jackie, I was like, oh, this is so much more interesting to me. It's like somebody who you haven't met who's actually organizing this stuff behind the scenes. So my first piece for Vanity Fair was like pretty much all about her and the trip. And then Alfonso, as soon as I saw him give the speech uh, and other things that was going, he also asked a really provocative question of uh, one of the state representatives. Um, and I was like, okay, that guy's interesting. He's gonna do interesting things. Um, sort of an unlikely one was Daniel Duff, who has an interesting role in the book because I interviewed I, probably 50 of at least of the 100 kids, or maybe more, and I would interview them. And then uh, when I finished, then I would get their name and you know their age in the year in school. And I interviewed him and, um, and then he told me his name, Daniel Duff, and he said, freshman. And I think, 14. Um, and I was like, you're a freshman? Because he'd been so articulate. I'm like, you're 14. I hope I got that right. I, uh, I should have checked it before I came up. But like, really? And I was like, did you know anything about politics before? And that's when he told me, like, well, not really. Like, I didn't know who them, I, I knew who um, Rick Scott was, but only because he looked like Voldemort. I was like, oh, my God. Okay, I love you already. Um, but I was thinking immediately, like, okay, that's the kind of person I'm looking for. And he was very active. He'd been going to the meetings. And I'm like, I want someone like that who is probably not, he's a freshman. They're not going to, he's not going to be running the show. Um, but he's going to play, be playing an interesting role in this. And there's something you see differently. If you're David, Emma, Cameron, whatever, uh, and Jackie, it would turn out who are running things and organizing things, you have a great take on it and what it's like to organize it. But then you're blind to other sorts of things. For instance, if you're Jackie organizing it, you're blind to what it's like to be like taking orders or direction or whatever from Jackie. Um, and just as basically a worker bee, you know, and somebody who's like, it's almost like the the, the great documentary, uh, 20 Feet from Stardom or whatever, that was like about backup singers. Like, what's it like his point of view? Um, and, you know, I would say, like, if I were if I were doing a documentary on Bruce Springsteen or somebody, uh, you know, I you know, some of my characters would be like the roadie, you know, the truck driver, the food service guy who's like seeing this stuff. Anyway, so I was looking for people like that. And thought, oh, Daniel Duff. Uh, so that's a really crucial part of my job, too, is finding them. Then later, you know, as I ran into them, the Peace Warriors, um, D'Angelo McDade uh, and uh, Alex. Uh, and Manny Oliver, but especially too when Jackie let me into the uh, the headquarters. And as soon as like I saw this red haired guy who I hadn't met before, and this was like about a month in, and he seemed to be kind of like running things in a way. Like people were turning to him for stuff, and I'm like, okay, who's this, who's this guy? And how come I've not met him before? Um, and I'm like, I got to find a way to talk to him. And then um, I did. I asked him and. Right while we were going into the room, like this other guy seemed to be creating this like weird online thing. He said, like, do you have a GIF? I don't know if it's GIF or GIF or like uh, an explosion. And and uh, the red-haired guy said, like, oh, you can Google it. And there's all kinds of blah, blah. And I'm like, what is that about? Um, so I asked the red-haired guy who turned out to be Matt Deitch uh, in the interview. And he told me, like, oh, he, you know, creates a lot of our memes. And, um, and I'm like, 
I want to interview that guy too. Like that's something's interesting going on. They're like, I didn't know any, they were doing anything like this. So, you know, finding really interesting people. Um, and then those became sort of like the, the major people for the book. Um, uh, originally I was just looking for people for, for magazine pieces. And we did a piece, I think called something like the memes men was, uh, um, was a vanity fair piece. Um, in fact, that was a piece where it was supposed to be about the march, lead up to the march. And after I interviewed the two of them, I called my uh, uh, editor from the parking lot. And that was like our big piece I've been working out for weeks. And I said, like, can I like completely like, can we ditch the piece I've been working out? I'm like, I think I get a better piece for you. This is so much more interesting. It's something I hadn't seen before. And he's like, OK. Um, and then it became a, a great one of my favorite chapters in the book. Um, so uh, just a couple of big things I want to talk about, and then I want to get to the questions with Jackie. Um, after that trip, you know, I was working on my first magazine piece, and a great friend of mine, Elise Jordan, who's a great political analyst on NBC and MSNBC, uh, she read it and she said, um, uh, there's something really missing here. Um, the main thing everybody in America wants to know, and this is like about a week out, um, is they see these kids on TV everywhere. They're everywhere. And everybody has this sort of take on who Emma Gonzalez is and David. They have definite personalities, we can tell. Um, are those the real kids? Is that what they're really like? Uh, the TV the TV David Hogg. Is that is that the real David Hogg? Um, and I was like, wow. That is the question that I should be answering. That is the thing I really sort of care most about, which I, without realizing. Um, I don't know. Like, the, uh, you know, I mean, that's the other part of my job is like when you don't know that the, the answer is like in most most people's jobs, when the answer is I don't know, it's important that you say, I don't know. Um, I can't write that yet because like I could kind of bullshit. Like I, I at that point, I had like a take. I had like an idea, like a sense of like what I bet it will turn out to be. But I don't really know. And like nobody wants to read your bullshit. Um, and I don't want to be stuck like bullshit will be in print forever if I get it wrong. So I'm like, okay, that's going to be like my next story. That's part of like finding out uh, what's going on here. Um, and I talk about that in the book and Jack and I might talk about that, uh, that it was like, it was true, but it wasn't the whole story. Um, so it was that next trip there that I started to really feel like I did start to get to know them and understood that when I went uh, leading out to the, the, the school walkout a month later uh that's when i also got so invigorated by their stories and realized i was just so in deep in this like i'm not leaving this in five weeks um and i i didn't i didn't uh sign on for the book then but i was thinking seriously about a book then but mainly i signed on to a print piece a much longer in-depth print piece for vanity fair uh to come out in the fall that i would spend quite a bit more time on so i would stay like maybe a couple months more but then i was thinking but toying with the idea of a book and maybe using some of these um, people. And the big question there was like, what would the story be? And with Columbine, it took me more than five years to even figure out, uh, well, I actually had an earlier version of the book that failed and then started over. But like figuring out like, what's the beginning, the middle and the end is, was important. And with these kids, I thought like with Parkland, like they've got an amazing thing going on, but like there's kind of a beginning here. Like, do we have a middle and end yet? And I wasn't sure. Um, and so partly the book was when I did, I think we decided to do it like about maybe two or three months out. Um, it was kind of an act of faith that there would be an ending. I, it was feeling an evolution of things. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit of the storyboard. Um, and uh, I'm gonna backtrack slightly though, um, because I forgot to show you uh, on my cell phone. Uh, when we were talking about um, a little earlier, we uh, were talking about, uh, objectivity and uh, my process. So that's a picture of me that ran in Benny Fair as my contributor's photo. Um, that's me at the, the, the Peace March in Chicago. And um, I kind of hated the picture of me, but what I liked about it, the reason I wanted to run it is because I, I am like facing away from the stage. And where I'm sitting there is on the press riser at this big event for this probably like three or four, 5,000 people, I guess, in Chicago. Um, and this huge Jennifer Lawrence and different uh, people, uh, Chance the Rapper, uh, are performing and speeches and blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's you know, banks of TV cameras and like, 
uh, facing the stage and like I'm facing away from it, which I didn't pose as like the photographer who was with me thought it was funny and took a picture of it um, and, and kept it. And then later it's like, I thought, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, because a couple things going on. First of all, I wanted to kind of block that out and get my impressions down uh, that I'd just been like gathering impressions from this whole thing. But also when I was looking up, uh, I wanted to be like watching the crowd. Cause like Jennifer uh, Hudson, did I say Jennifer Lawrence? Jennifer Hudson was great for coming. She sang Amazing Grace, it was wonderful. But like, I don't care. I'm not writing about that. Um, I want to know what it's like to be here for something like this in the crowd, reacting and responding to that. And I also was interested in things but like the fact that like three quarters of the people, I think it's been a while, ago, like, but it's usually the majority were, were white people. And I was thinking a couple things. First of all, they've been doing this for like 10 years. Like, um, have white people ever showed up before? And probably no. If not, how do they feel about that? And so the best way when you've got these sort of sticky, awkward questions like that is just like, ask people. So, you know, afterwards I'm thinking about these things, but I'm watching them and I'm watching the interaction between and how they're interacting and mixing. Um, and then after, by the way, the questions were like, no, they'd almost had no white people ever before. And how they felt about it was like, kind of conflicted, but for the most part, it was like, we'll take it. If, you know, Emma Gonzalez and like, you know, Jackie and, and those kids, are gonna bring a bunch of you know white people in media uh, who finally care about this and bring NBC and CNN and everybody else. Um, if that's what it takes to get you all here um, to you know care about urban violence and gunfire and kids dying in our neighborhoods, well, kind of you know kind of sad that you would never come before and care about us, but like, but we'll take it. It's uh, we'll take we'll take what we could get. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, sorry to do something completely. I just remembered that I'd forgotten that. Um, but so here is the storyboard, which I still have up on my wall. And um, maybe we'll do an insert shot later. It is also backwards. But this is a, like, I use storyboards all the time. And this is, of course, a late version of it. Like, um, it's like kind of an artistic thing that I love here. This is actually like um, aluminum. But I map out the whole book. And basically in four pieces. And usually a storyboard starts something more like this, which is like one of the five sections of my next book on gay sections, uh, on gay soldiers. And it's a section called Coming of Gay, which is as they came of age and also figured out they were gay. And here are like the two main characters and other stuff going. So each one of these is a chapter. And so usually, this by the way is a storyboard for the speech I'm giving right now. It starts out sloppy. And that, no, that's a to-do list. First of all, there's a sloppier version of it. Then it comes out to like better like this. Then I usually go to post-it notes or then something like that as I move the post-its around to figure it out. And then sometimes I get to something like this where I can keep it on the wall and look at it. And I actually use photographs of the things for a very easy visual reminder. So I can like in a flash figure it out because here's my desk. Here's where I work, where I've got the two giant screens where I can move things between them. Um, and I could just look up to my right, and here is the book, all in one place. And the way I envision it is four sort of main sections. Um, and this is partway through, then I never sort of updated it. Um, but one is the genesis of the movement, basically just that first couple days, I call it genesis. Um, this is the march and the and DC and things related to it, then moving on, whatever that might be, and the midterm elections. By the way, I finished this about like right here. Um, and so this is the future. So like kind of guessing what might still happen. I knew that graduation was ahead, the spring musical, the second walkout was coming, Twitter battles were already going on, the primaries. So these are like maybes, who knows? And it kind of pretty much turned out like that, except these two got combined into one. There's now three sections in the book. So that is a really, really useful device to me because otherwise it's very hard. As you maybe can tell from the speech, I have like, a hundred different ideas going on. I'm like constantly bouncing off different ideas. It's hard for me, very hard to get organized and clutter. You know, I specifically didn't clean up my desk before. This piece is like, why show you the bullshit version? That, that's that's what my desk looks like. That's that's you know, that's how I work. Um, but then my hard drive is incredibly anal, like everything organized, uh, once I get it organized. Otherwise, it's a disaster. And then I have all these different files. 
Uh, like down there, I have all sorts of files. But anyway, um, because my head, inside my head, looks very much like my desk. It totally helps if I can map it out and have something very clean and understandable that I can look to. And actually, the picture, so it jumps out. I go, okay. And there's three different sections. I'm, you know, writing that section one, the Genesis. That's like the main cluster of what this story is about. Um, and so, anyway, so that's that's kind of like the big part of my process. How I take all this material, different stuff, and work it out into a story. And I was really unsure about like those last two columns, like would that be an ending point? And it turned out to be something a little different. It really turned out that on the bus tour um, across America, which when I was planning that out hadn't even been announced yet. I didn't even know it would exist, but it turned out to be a situation where the kids kind of changed on that tour. And many of them came to um, a realization of, how much more of this they could take and where they were going. And so that felt like the begin the, the completion of an arc and kind of a resting point. Because I one thing I figured out very early on too in this book is the subtitle, Birth of a Movement. Um, that that was what the story was, that like the birth of something, the creation. And I thought about the fact that if I were ever to have written or were to do a story and go back about the civil rights movement, I wouldn't want to write the story about the I Have a Dream speech or the civil rights legislation in 1964, any of like the stuff that we normally see, like which is the end of it, right? The culmination. I would want to go back to the 1940s and 50s and Martin Luther King going to India and meeting Gandhi and whatever antecedents, things I don't even know about, like how did it start? Um, anyway, that's what this project was. That's what I realized pretty early on, but this book was not about the whole movement uh, and where they would get to what it would result in. It was the birth of this phase of the movement, of the gun safety movement. And by the end of the that bus trip, um, and then it turned up the midterms too. That felt like the last chapter in the birth. Um, and so that was happening as I was writing it, but I felt like that's a story. That's the beginning and end. You know, this is the story of the of the birth. Um, so I guess you guys can decide, you know, whether that was a worthy story. Um, but that was um actually that was kind of the process. So I'm gonna leave it there and I'm really excited to talk to Jackie. Um to talk about like our interaction of like how so this was from, from her point of view and interacting with me, how she went to see, see things very differently. And I'm curious things she wondered about from my point of view too. So like, I'm really excited to have this conversation. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so hi everyone. My name is Jacqueline Corin. Friends call me Jackie. And as you know, I'm one of the students highlighted in the book Parkland. Uh, I'm actually currently in Parkland, Florida because I unfortunately cannot be in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. And before I jump into conversation with Dave, uh, I wanna briefly tell a bit of my backstory from my point of view, just so you know me and my experience and place in all of this a little better. Uh, so the morning of February 14th, 2018, which was the day of the shooting, uh, Valentine's Day as well, uh, it felt like just another day to me. Uh, you know, I woke up, ate breakfast, packed my bag, and was out the door. And the day dragged on the same as any other uh, until fourth period, which was the last period of the day. Uh, we heard the fire alarm go off. And we, fo we followed fire alarm protocol. And just as we've been trained to, I'm sure all of you were trained to do the same. Uh, and we walked out to the far end of the bus lot. And the second that followed really changed my life forever. Uh, my best friend, Emily, grabbed my hand and screamed that she had just heard a gunshot. And really my heart just fell into the pits of my stomach uh, and we ran. Uh, we ran with a stampede of kids desperately trying to make their way into a classroom for cover. And I was ultimately one of the lucky ones. I had gotten to a classroom and hid there for almost three hours. I didn't know it then, but 17 of my peers and teachers were murdered while I sat in silence. Uh, 
And by the time it hit 5 p.m., members of the FPI uh, had knocked down the glass on our door and evacuated us in order to return home to our parents. And at this point, I didn't know who or how many people had been murdered. So I turned on the TV to see news coverage of what had just happened. And I saw a helicopter view of my school on national television, which forced me to come to the realization that the Parkland I knew will never just be Parkland anymore. And fast forward to the next day, baking in my fury and, and sadness, I realized that I needed to do something productive with my fear. Uh, so I made a Facebook post that basically highlighted the needs for gun safety policies and, and for young people to actually stand up and say something about our collective trauma, which I'm sure many of you feel as well. The, the unfortunate rea reality is that many of us fear getting shot in our schools or on the streets because we grew up knowing about Columbine and Sandy Hook and, and with constant red code drills. And my family friend, who had actually been a member of the city council, had seen my post on Facebook and connected me with someone that she knew on the, at the Capitol. And before I knew it, I was on the phone with a Florida state senator organizing a lobbying trip to the Florida state legislature for 100 of my classmates. And I spent the next few days organizing this trip on that living room floor that Dave had mentioned at the beginning of his keynote. And fast forward a few days, I would successfully carry out my Tallahassee lobbying trip by basically just doing trial and error. Uh, I knew we needed buses, so I called bus company. Uh, I knew we needed a place to stay overnight in Tallahassee, so I figured out a way to work with the Civic Center in Tallahassee to set up cots. And thankfully, there was a lovely Senate, state senator that helped me organize meetings with other legislators so that students from my school could actually talk with members of the Florida State Legislature. And after that trip, we basically spent the next months, uh, the next month rather, uh, by we, I mean the co-founders of March for Our Lives, um, with donors and experienced organizers and artists and city officials in DC to try to pull together the main march in DC. And in the meanwhile, we had interview after interview with press, making sure we were advertising the march in the best way we could. And often it felt like a chore really to talk to press because it was a combination of one, recounting trauma and two, feeling stressed that you might do or say something wrong that would be covered differently than what you had intended. But there was one journalist, Dave, who was always really easy to talk to. It was a combination of his kindness and also the fact that he had worked with members of the Columbine community that made it pretty simple to trust and open up to him. And for the next year, basically, Dave covered all of us with grace and understanding, making sure to actually highlight us as human beings as 17 and 18 year olds, because that's how old we were at the time, and some even younger, uh, that were just trying to accomplish this thing that seemed larger than life, uh, all while we were still going to school and, and working through our traumas that will ultimately last a lifetime. So now I'll bring Dave back into the conversation so we, ac we can actually talk about, you know, what we were both thinking during these times together. And my question for you that I've always wondered, Dave, is like, what exactly does, did your writing process look like? You know, after a day of, you know, observing us, what did you do to kind of sort that information and put it on paper? That's really interesting. And by the way, I was just like, uh, I was just actually like, I'm not always a big crybaby. That what actually was like making me tear, uh, tear up that you said that. Um, I don't well, know how true. true that was, but like, uh, that's, uh, that's really kind of, uh, you know, okay, before I answer that, well, I, I gotta, I, I can just like throw one out thing, out one thing that uh, I get asked about talking to you guys, uh, just sort of maybe in response to that, and then I'll answer your question is, um, you know, people ask like how I got you to talk to you oh, all talking and stuff. And I was like, uh, one of the things I say is like, uh, I never talked mm -hmm. to them like they were children. 
uh, you know, or, or or anything else. Like I just talk to you just like like a person, right? Like, uh, and I have like all these nieces and nephews, and like, and also like, you know, I don't know. Um, but like to me, like. You know, I got a four-year-old nephew and I just like talk to him like a little guy, you know, like sometimes he like doesn't understand, but like, I, I try not to dumb it down, you know, mm -hmm. or like, uh, yeah, or just, I don't know, um, or, or whatever, but like, yeah, I sort of like, just try to like, so yeah, hopefully that, um, that, that, that does help. But, um, oh, so what am I processing? You know what? It, okay. So it's, it's, it's always different. Um, but I, you know, one of the things I have to do is like trick myself into writing, um, because I get really, uh, I, was, I'm like a super, I don't have superstitions, but we're not supposed to use the word writer block kind of because it's almost like, like oh, that will be blocked if we just say that. But, but I have like versions of it all the time. But it, to me, it's more like intimidation. Um, so I'm constantly having to trick myself into doing it. And I wish I had an example, but like, uh, so I have all these different uh, ways, uh, one of which, Actually, so this is actually just like a to-do list, but I actually made these, I, I put it in a cool frame because like uh, these, I do so much of my stuff on there, but um, I outline stuff as I'm going, I sort of map it out and I don't have any like examples in front of me, I usually do, but as I'm going frequently, so I'll, okay, so here's the outline of the speech. And then I always, I tend to usually like put in like way too many details as I'm going, but I got to figure out like, what does this bullet point really mean? So I'll start like filling in more writing and I'll be like halfway down this whiteboard of just like, and then I use like the more finer grain uh, pen like this. I'll be like halfway down here, just like paragraphs of text. And I realize like pretty soon doing it, like a few lines into it, like, oh, I'm kind of actually like writing this scene. Like I'm figuring out what's the go here. Like I'm writing the scene, but then it's like fantastic. Then I won't sit over there frozen up at like the blank screen. It's just like, you know, like a writer afraid of the blank page and now the blank screen. That's totally true of writers since the beginning of time. Like Homer, I'm sure whatever the hell, you know, the Greeks were writing on, it was like, oh, the great blank, blank scroll. Um, but I can sort of trick myself into having a bunch. And for me, it's really getting started is the hard part. Because once I've got a scene going, then I know. And another way I do is the phone all the time. Um, you know, I actually sent you a bunch of, I was going to send you a bunch of like ideas for different topics to talk about. And um, and so it, like while working in the garden, actually like working churning compost so at my community garden in Brooklyn, um, you know, while well, out there, it really clears my head. And so I was thinking about it, like, okay, here's all the things I want to talk to about Jackie. And with my hands filthy with gloves on, but like I hit, you know, go on my phone and just recorded like a five minute thing of like blurting out ideas um, of different topics to talk about. And then I was, of course, supposed to like organize it later and send it. But instead this morning, I just... <laughs> I had my research to transcribe it and I just sent you the whole thing because I ran out of time to doing it to do it. Um, but so that's another way I get myself going of just getting thoughts on paper and either whether it's like just paper being like the iPhone or the whiteboard, I trick myself out of not doing it because when I'm sitting there, it feels like it's going to be official, right? Like I have to write with like a capital, like it has to be good. Like it's going to be like, you know, is it going to be as good as Hemingway today? Like, that's really intimidating to be there. So if I can trick myself into just like, oh, I'm just getting some thoughts down. Um, and sometimes they're good or I like them. And then also, like, once I'm really into it, then I can, like, go. Then I can come. I'm not intimidated here because I'm more... I'm more invigorated and interested in what's already going on, but I forget to be, like, intimidated or afraid. So I just get going. Um, so that's a big piece. The other big thing is, like, though just like do it quickly like and what i learned from columbine and so many of my props in writing school so many told, so many told me told me so many times the the more research you do the bigger this mountain of stuff becomes and probably all of you probably you at harvard right now or like in high school when you're doing things like when you're researching something you probably found like the more you research like the harder it gets because now i have all this great stuff but like mm -hmm. I, it, it, the paper has to be 10 pages or five pages or 20, whatever it is. And you've got like hundreds of pages of stuff and it becomes more like, how do I turn this into like this? Whereas if you do it a piece at a time, you do an interview or read something interesting, oh, I get a couple paragraphs. 
you've accumulated stuff. And then when you've finished this, you know, all the stuff, all the research, there's still all this, but you, you have stuff laid out is, and you're sort of like, oh, I've got this piece could be like, this is the nugget of a chapter. I've got all these different pieces and I can figure, you know, add the other pieces. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, like, we, do you go through a similar process just like with writing papers and stuff for school or do you have any, like, you, you're such a different, you know, more organized person than me. You have, might have just a very different, but what's it like for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, writing papers and also writing speeches for for events are kind of a similar process for me. I'm definitely not as like jumbled. I kind of like when I just like commit to something, I'll sit down and just like, you know, bust it out. Uh, but I definitely see how, you know, you kind of just like learning out ideas can be really helpful when you're actually trying to write something that's very long. Um, because I mean, I don't even know how you do it, d did it, uh, or continue to do it. Uh, cause back then, I mean, you, you definitely gained so much information in a single day and then you had to make sure you actually wrote all of that down. So you remembered it after a few more days of, of the same amount of information. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's definitely, you know, really admirable how, how that process all worked. Um, I have another question for you. Now, like technology is key now though. Cause I take everything and then like it also, I can afford part-time, not a, enough, but like a, like a researcher who can like uh, transcribe it. Cause it can take like hours and it's just mind numbing to just like have to transcribe this stuff. And so then I spend a day talking to a bunch of you and I mean all that down and I could go on to the next one knowing when I get home that I'll have all the stuff that I can read through and highlight and it'll be there. And then remind me like, cause you're right. It's sort of like, like, Oh, that's right. We talked to her, she told me that, you know? And then like, um, cause even sometimes I get like, you know, like my mind is like jello by like, you know, the end of the third interview by the end of the day, but mm -hmm. even like barely, you know, and sometimes like almost I have to like fake it. Cause I'm like, like okay, I don't even know if I can ask an intelligent question, but like, by the way, an answer to another thing you didn't like, like the key of interview is is asking a good asking good questions. It's getting you to give good answers. And so even if I'm checked out and brain dead, I'm like, I'm not answering good questions anymore. It's not about the questions. If I've got you talking and you're telling me good stuff, then like my brain can be like mush and <laughs> going to the recorder. And then tomorrow or a week later, I'm still gonna have like all your really cool stuff down. And so it doesn't matter that my mind is already past capacity. Yeah, for sure. And kind of going off of that, the fact that you did have so much information, you know, in your process of editing and, and all of that, what made you decide to keep certain things in and take other certain things out? Because I remember talking to you, you know, in the weeks and months leading up to actually publishing it a year after that you were like, oh, I don't think I can include this. And, and I don't think I should put this in, but I really want to make sure I highlight this. So what was that process like for you? Well, some of it's really, I mean, so much of it is intuitive. And um, I remember actually early in my career, um, I get nervous because uh, an AP reporter, it was covering a trial, I think it was the trial of Matthew Shepard, the gay college student in Wyoming, uh, who was at the time, before you guys were born, um, but was like a really horrible thing. Uh, it became sort of like the most prominent gay bashing ever. Like uh, this kid was beaten to death and left for dead, tied up on this uh, post in the middle of nowhere and, and outside Cheyenne, Wyoming, and was found like, a couple of days later, still alive. Anyway, it was like a, it became, the, it was like a seminal moment in um, the gay rights movement. And I covered both the murder trials. Um, uh, anyway, um, but I remember at that, uh, it's when I was just getting back into journalism. Um, and I remember an AP reporter who had covered trials a million times talking to another young journalist was asking him questions. And I'm saying like, you get to like, you just like hear the quotes when somebody gives like the really the money quote, like the really great quote, like you know immediately and you know you're gonna use that one and you just copy that down versus like turning out the rest and you get that quote. And I was thinking like, wow, maybe I shouldn't be a writer. Cause like, I don't always like, I, I often don't know till later. Like I don't know, like, um, but he was right. Like the longer you do it, and I don't always, but now I do it like uh, so much when I hear some, whether it's the quote or just the topic, sometimes you start talking to me about something and I'm like, 
that's going to be in there. Like, I remember, like, when you said to me um, that first, I know it was about a month out. Sometimes also I date things by, like, what else was happening. Like, I was there for the, the for school walkout. So it was, like, 30, you know, it was exactly one month. So I know we were one month out. And I came down there, and it was that week when um, I actually interviewed David, and then I interviewed you, I think, two days later. Um, it was the first long one I'd done in his kitchen for like an hour with him. And then I think I spent longer with you, but, um, um, and you know, talked about David at that point, by the way, I figured out like, I needed to ask each of you about each other, like to get your impressions and like learn things and also like what, uh, but anyway, um, you said something about like, um, uh, you're like, you said something about like, like, uh, Oh yeah, that's like the, that David, like, um, you know, that's so, you know, the media David is so not him. He's like this fun, could be person. You actually showed me a video that then like you couldn't show me because it was him like acting like really guilt could be silly. And, but for me, it clicked like, like, oh, that video is like the physical embodiment of how he sounded on the phone that day. And like, you were telling me it's the real David and I'd see him like, like, okay, that's him. And, like, I, you know, I want to see that to study it. And you're like, no, I don't, I don't think you'd be that comfortable. Um, so you respect that you never sent it to me. I'm like, okay. But just seeing it helped cue me in like, okay, I get what you're talking about. So as you described, so I got, but you were like, but then the thing that you really said to me is like, um, you said, um, I think the way you put it, I think it put it in the book is like, uh, I only met that David this week or in the last couple of days or something. And you actually put it that way, that David. And that really was so crystallizing. Like I knew exactly what you meant. Like it was almost like a different person. And like, I also had gotten that David is like really shy. And I get to know his like mom, Rebecca, pretty well too. Like, 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 and she would tell me too, like, yeah, he does blah, blah, blah. But inside he's like really shy. Like, and you know, takes a while to come out to people. And like, now he's on, so he's coming out to the media, like to all you, but like, that's not, you know, um, the, you know, the main part of David's personality. And so I was getting that for you. But anyway, when I, so when I hear certain things, I'm like, it's less about the great quote. It's like the great insight, right? Like I was trying to figure you all out and you were telling me about each other. And that's when I started really understanding the media depiction of these kids, of you all, is true, but it's not the whole story. And there's like a sliver of you that we're getting and you're not faking it, it's the real you, but it's not the whole you, right? And for all of you, and like the behind the scenes, like we don't always act that way. Um, and David, you know, in particular, I think more those so than most of you was the difference was really striking. And partly like he wanted to be a serious person. So he's presenting serious David and also angry. I noticed in that one interview, he got more and more angry as he went. And I'm thinking like, talking about this is making him angry, I think. And I similarly with Brian Rohrbaugh, who I think it was the angry dad from Columbine, the father of one of the victims, he would get so worked up talking about it. And I, you know, I interviewed him off and on for 10 years, right? And he would get, the longer, I would do three hour interviews with him sometimes, and by hour three, he'd be like bouncing off the walls. And I got learned really like, okay, there's different Brian's, but like the, the fact of talking, him talking about it is changing it. But, um, I don't know where I was going with that, but like, uh, yeah. oh, but scenes. So like, but sometimes I also grab is like, like I'm looking for scenes that like illuminate you guys and like tell readers something that is important about you that they didn't already know. And I'm also looking for like, like characters, I, you know, so can you do like individuals who also will give another piece of this perspective. Like I knew early on that like, I, you know, Emma needed to be in the book because, you know, She's like the Joan of Arc of this, right? I mean, I hate it, but you know, for shorthand, um, uh, I was careful not to use that phrase in the book, but like, uh, so she needed to be in there, but like, she wouldn't be the main, a main character. Cause like, or even David less so, I mean, sort of in between, it's like, like, you already know, like who wants to read, you know, like, you already know what you think, or you probably, or all you probably want to know. Like, I think somebody coming to this wants to know, like, tell me the story I don't already know. Like, to me, it was like, I learned about what you were doing. Like, the behind the scenes is much more interesting. Like, how do you pull something out of this off? Like, the stage manager and the person who, like, you know, the um, I remember what I, like, I said, I was talking to you early on, trying to figure out exactly your role. And I was like, oh, you're kind of the COO. Um, and you did, and you didn't know what that term meant. Like, right, you'd never heard it before. Like, you're a junior in high school, like, COO. I'm like, oh, it's like a CEO, but this chief operating officer. You probably heard it a million times now. 
But I'm like, oh, you're like the COO. Like, you, you actually run the show. Um, so mm -hmm. I thought, that would be more interesting. Anyway, so, like, it's always a balance, though, of, like, putting these together. And some of the things were just almost alchemy, like, and, like, missing pieces. And it is sort of, like, almost providential the way they fall into place. Like, like I... I didn't want the book to be about like the victims, like the families uh, who lost someone. And I'll, 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 I'll sort of wrap this up. Right but I, but I, I knew I, something should be in there about like someone who had lost someone, but I didn't know what or how that would fit in. That almost felt like out of place. And yeah. then I met Danny Oliver and he was like, just magical. And I knew like in his office, like this guy's so fascinating. Like he's so called like, I'm going to write about him. Like he's mm -hmm. amazing. Um, and then it filled that piece, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, and um, I, I remember late in the game, um, realizing after we were supposed to let, after my like deadline, we we're supposed to be doing it. Like I, I called my editor and realized like, I, I don't have anything about PTSD or like it, it comes up occasionally a long line, but that chapter is like only like four pages called PTSD that like explains like what it is and like, you know, like how it happens and like what the dangers and you know, basically a PTSD 101 kind of primer. Like that was written in like, like, you know, the last days when it was already in copy editing. And I was like, there's all this stuff in PTSD, but then I never tell the reader, like, like, you know, and step back and like, what the hell are we talking about? And like, like sort of like the medical version and like, at, oh, it was over Thanksgiving. Um, and like, we were already in page proofs. Like they had already created page proofs and I wasn't really supposed to be adding anything. Like, um, I, I got to, I called my chapter editor. I've got to insert this chapter. Cause like, and then I, you know, interviewed some, you know, shrinks that I luckily had already encountered in an interview before. I'm like, I got to do an in-depth interview with you and just get like the basics and about these kids. And, you know, she'd already talked about you and like, but that was like, bam, 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 bam. Cause then I started thinking like, what is missing? So like, I, you know, um, and I don't know, that might've been when we talked about it. Like, uh, what what did I forget? Like what you know? If you were reading this whole book, like what you know? What should be in there? All right, sorry to give yeah. such a long freaking answer. No, I mean it, it directly answered what I was asking, and it's it's really interesting to hear about you know how you made your decisions and and forming like the amazing piece that is Parkland. Uh, in the last couple of minutes, I just wanted to ask if you had any questions for me. And yeah, and yeah okay, good, yeah, because I was just going to ask you. Okay, I was thinking too. Um, uh, so I, you know, kind of a pivotal thing for me was, um, well, two things actually. Uh, so one was like, uh, after the Tallahassee trip, and then I really wanted to follow up with you and I'd met your dad in the parking lot and he'd given me his number and, uh, your mom's cell phone number. Um, and I think I texted them both together, um, and said, you know, I'd love to talk to Jackie and follow up. And your mom responded like, well, now there's like this PR firm we're supposed to go through. So I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, we can't, you know, you have to go through them. Um, and I don't know, like 30 seconds later or something, your dad texts back. is like, she'll talk to you. We're in the car and we're in DC. She's going to finish up with us and stuff and she'll talk to you after. So like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, um, I'll make it. Um, so like, what was that like? What was happening on your end? And, and how did, and why did you decide to do it? And like, how did that all play out? Yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, um, I think like in the beginning we were just all being kind of attacked with press requests, so that's why we had this third entity come in and kind of help us because, you know, we were trying to dedicate so much of our time to actually organizing the march and organizing some events for students to get involved with, but you know there was so much. Uh, press that was just coming at us that we needed someone else to feel that through. But that's really funny that um, my parents kind of stepped in that way. They definitely were also just really confused at the time. I mean, all of us were kind of just like, what is going on? Like, uh, you know, two months ago, we couldn't even have, you know, thought of ima or imagined this kind of life that we were now living. Um, but but yeah, uh, that's funny that my my parents kind of stepped in. All they wanted to do was protect me in that moment. Um, I know. Yeah. Well, I might have misunderstood. Like I hadn't gotten your number, so those the reason I texted them were those are the only numbers I had. Mm -hmm. And so I went through like you know because that's also what you do as a journalist. Like like okay, well his dad gave me the number, so I'll, like I'll try him. Um, 
and uh, through to you. But like, I was glad that like, apparently you decided to say yes. Um, well, the, another big one that it was like a month later when we were in, um, when um, you got me permission to come into the headquarters, which was like really crucial. And that's also when I met Matt and, you know, Dylan and like learned this and opened a lot of doors. But it also helped me just sort of like see what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. And that week, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys were supposed to tell me, like you might know, like whether you were supposed to be referring to an office, but like, as I talked to like all the other kids, lots of them would slip and instead of saying Cameron's house, they kept referring to the office. And I'd be like, office? And then I'd be like, oh, I didn't say that. Uh, I'd be like, okay, so there's an office. So don't push it. <laughs> first I asked Cameron, or no, first I asked Alfonso. And he's like, oh, I don't know if I can. And then I like, said so like, how, you know, could he give me some pictures? And he said, okay, but then he forgot. I don't know if he forgot or forgot, but, um, um, but so then we were at Starbucks, right? And I was interviewing you outside on the sidewalk. And I was like, I wasn't even sure, you know, but I'm like, I thought, you know, just like ask. I'm like, you know, could you get me in there maybe? I think maybe at first I asked for pictures of like, could you even get me in? And you were like, mm, I'd have to ask maybe. Um, and then I didn't even know you were texting. Cause like, you're just like under the table, you had your phone. And like 20, 30 minutes later, you're like, okay, you can go. I'm like, what? Like in the middle of something, it was like, uh, and you had like texted the whole group and gotten like the okay. Um, but so like, how did that go from your end? Like, what were you thinking when I first asked? What was your first reaction? And then like, how did, tell me more about like all your version of like what happened. Cause I've never asked you. So I don't really know like what, all I know is you said yes. And I was like overjoyed or like the group said yes. And like, you got me permit. Like, and I know you interceded on my behalf. So I've always been grateful, but I never knew like what all that entailed. So go. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, back during that period of time, you know, basically the world's eyes were on us and it was really intimidating and we wanted to make sure to maintain a level of security. Um, so that's why we kind of never let any press know that we even had an office because, you know, God forbid they brought a camera in or, you know, actually filmed like where it was located, which actually inevitably did happen. And we then got threats from um, kind of like a white supremacist organization um, in the South Florida area. So we had to actually switch offices. Um, but, you know, before that, uh, we kind of just like made our general rule not to bring anyone over. And you were the first one that we brought in, you know, mostly because you didn't have a camera on you and, and you were only print. So we were kind of like, oh, it might be actually like good for, you know, someone to talk about what this behind the scenes uh, looks like. Um, and I was kind of the one that was just like, yeah, we're gonna do it. <laughs> um, just cause no, I, I think like a lot of us did, you know, already know you and, and felt, you know, connected to you in some way and had a lot of respect for you. The fact that you, you worked so long with, you know, so many members of the Columbine community. So we had this inherent trust for you. Um, and it ended up working out and you wrote, you know, a wonderful book about us and it really captured everything that, you know, so many other journalists were unable to do. So, so we thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's looking like we're running out of time. <laughs> so uh, I just want to say thank you to, um, UW and thank you, Dave, for everything you've done in, in creating this story about myself and my community and all my friends. Um, so I'll, I'll leave you with the last words. Yeah, I want to thank you too. I, thank, I mean, to everybody, all you students, like thanks for reading and, and for listening to us. Um, but I, you know, I don't know if I, I thank you guys enough. Um, well, actually, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to. Um, a couple of, I, I really, I thank you guys for what you do. Um, because, uh, and I, yeah, I mean, it's your story. And I, you know, you guys made it happen and are making it happen. Um, I mean, I think we might be, you know, very, very close. Maybe we should end that way of like, for God's sake, everyone watching this. Uh, there's still time to register in Wisconsin, right? I think we like timed this. So there's still, a, in fact, we think the same day registration, but whatever, like, if you're not registered, for God's, for God's sake, register and vote. Um, and if you don't think that guns are on the ballot or things that matter to you are on the ballot, they're on the ballot. And mm -hmm. I just 
I just wrote a piece for Vanity Fair that was published yesterday that you can read too on Gabby Giffords, who's kind of amazing. But Joe Biden, so maybe I am going to take a second, um, has proposed a slew of gun reforms that would be there much beyond what anything Barack Obama uh, uh, suggested or any Democrat or anyone since the 1960s. So I've researched now the, the whole history of gun safety. Uh, the gun safety movement, there have been two major rounds of landmark legislation, gun legislation in American history. In the 1930s, in reaction to Al Capone and the gangsters, the introduction of the Tommy gun and, and bank robbers and the machine guns, that was the first round that the NRA actually participated in the 1930s. And in the 60s, in response to all the assassinations, there was another major round of major changes. Those are the only two. The stuff more than 30 things that Biden has proposed would be equivalent and landmark to those. It would be the third time in American history. And if three Senate seats flip and the White House, this will happen. Two years after what you guys began and largely because of what you began, Jackie, you changed the landscape, but we are on the verge and it can happen. And it's on the ballot. So if you don't think your vote matters or whatever, if you think gun safety matters, we can finally change this. We are this close. So get your, sorry, get your butt out there and vote. Um, it's really important. And uh, I also wanna like tack on one like personal thing that I told Alfonso. Um, you know, I wasn't supposed to go to this because of my PT, PTSD stuff with Columbine. Um, and I don't, I don't think I really put this in the book this way, but like uh, you, the year with you guys really healed me. Like that's forever, so it's not completely going away, but I am like a different guy. By the end of that year, I, I first, I, I get to see like the happy Dave that was like 20 or the 30 year old Dave, that, that like uh, when this whole started for me at Columbine. Um, that that whole dark cloud that was like over my life for 20 years um it finally started to lift um because of the years the year i spent with you guys and uh it really did heal me so i'm really grateful on a personal level for all that so thanks and i can't wait to see uh can't wait to see when you're a member of congress or secretary of state or like the third female president or whatever you're going to be. <laughs> yeah, I got to graduate college first. What? I got to graduate college first. I know, right, right. <laughs> I know, right, one step at a time, but yeah, you're right away. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, I guess we'll sign off. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Um, and yes, make sure to vote and, you know, get all your friends to vote. and. You know, finish reading Parkland because it's a wonderful, wonderful story, and yeah. I'm not—I'm wonderful and sad, and I hope it inspires you in, you know, you know, you know, healing, you know, your own trauma, or you know, helping your community. Thanks. Bye.